Clutch with Salam and Rasulullah, and we're broadcasting almost live today, all the way from Fletcher Street. We're here in Fort Worth. I remember when I lived in Dallas, we used to call it Fort Worthless. <laughs> <laughs> That's a competitive kind of a thing, though. Alhamdulillah. And then Allah guided me to his town, and I learned how to be maybe a little bit better made. <laughs> It's a great chance to be with everybody here today. Those of you that are listening to us online, I'm here in one of the very first of the mosques that I ever visited after entering into Islam. And there's a lot of funny stories that happened to us when we came into Islam. And uh, some interesting experiences even took place right here. But that's not the subject that we're going to be talking about today. We've been dealing with the subject about sharing our perspective as Muslims, um, uh, who is God, what's our relationship with God, and especially salvation in Islam. This has been our topic sort of for the whole weekend, and I want to kind of stay with that, just because I have most of my stuff memorized for that, this uh, particular event, etc. Now, also I'd like to remind you that you can visit our other internet websites at islamalways.com, islamyesterday.com, the one you're listening to now, where we have the audios and videos, and Islam Tomorrow. That's our progressive website. We like to be right up to date. We're very advanced, by the way. Alhamdulillah. And speaking of that, I thought it would be appropriate, you know, to show you, especially the ladies like style shows. But, in, you know, in Islam, it's not really right for ladies to be uh, walking around showing off their bodies and clothes and things like that in front of men. And so I thought it would be appropriate if I introduced a bid'ah or an innovation here, which is I'm going to do a style show for you guys. Does that sound fair? <laughs> what? <laughs> because, well, I'm gonna, it's going to be the opposite. The Prophet Islam said do the opposite of what the kuffar do. Don't be like them. Be the opposite, right? So instead of young, beautiful girls showing off you know, the latest styles. Well, we're going to old man who is... <laughs> Does it make sense? This is totally opposite. Wearing really weird clothes. <laughs> How do you like this outfit, by the way? Like it? Red and white. Now, there's two colors you can't argue with. It's very basic. And then I have a white on white outfit here. Very... <laughs> might help me with this thing, you know? And I'm not going to walk down a gangplank to get that, unless you get a wheelchair. <laughs> but anyhow, I said, you know, these folks, they need to know what's happening. Because maybe you don't know the latest styles. For the ladies, it's what's happening in Paris, right? That's the big thing. What's going down in Paris, i got to know about it. Or what's happening in the, you know, in New York or uh, California. We've got to keep up with the styles. That's very important for the ladies, right? So I figure for the Muslims, we got to keep up with what's the latest style from Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yeah, and now this will be, I'm only going to be showing you the, the more elegant wear today, but for the, you know, for the outback stuff, you know, the camouflage things and, you know, places to keep your grenades, stuff like that, I'll have that. <laughs> you know, in an imam code, I don't know if you know this, Imam coats have these little tiny pockets up here. You know what that's for? Huh? For your miswak? Or where you keep the extra Quran, the little small one when you forget in Ramadan and you can open it up. <laughs> right. Yeah. What is he talking about? I don't do that. But it's right there. If you ever wonder what's this little tiny pocket for? It's not so you can scratch, right? <laughs> I love you guys, man. You're laughing at the dumbest jokes. <laughs> I'm going to save the soundtrack and patch these laughs on some of my other jokes in this work. <laughs> what do you think? It's pretty cool? But actually, this is not a Saudi code. You have to know that. This is Turkish. This is a Turkish imam code. They have two. They have a black one and a white one. And they will not pray without the coat on. They, they don't need wudu, but they need the coat. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, actually, I make wudu every week, whether I need it or not. <laughs> I'm that way, I'm a clean kind of a guy. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> 
Oh, that hurts. You know, I guess I should go to the next stage here. We don't have a whole lot of time, so can somebody strike up a dance? Dun, 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 dun. Okay, here we go. This comes off. And elegantly throw it across the room. There that goes. Uh, now, I have to show you. I got, I'm kind of wired up here a little bit. In fact, if I had any more wires, I'd be eligible to be an FBI agent. <laughs> but I, I'm not going to do this. There we go. Don't run away. Here we go. Now, this outfit actually comes with another part which fell off in the trunk of the car. It has the belt. You know the black rings? So you have to imagine that. Hey, wait a minute. I got it. There we go. Okay, I did that part. All right. I have to do everything by habit. I, I missed something. I can't do the whole thing. All right. Now, the gall came off. Now this. I have to show you how to do this. This is for people who can't afford the gall. like this. Very, this is very, very, very chic is to be able to up. <laughs> like that? No, this is real. This is real deal, baby. No, I'm not done. I'm not done. Hold on. There's more coming up. There's different ways you can put this thing on. You can go like this, hey? You seen that one? Yes. I mean, this is like... <laughs> But the latest thing, I don't know if you girls are ready for this or not. I don't know, maybe, uh, I don't want to, it's going to be rated R. <laughs> are you ready? This is like the latest of the latest styles in Saudi. It's so you don't lose tradition, but at the same time you really catch up with the world. So I have to show you this, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Saudi Arabia. She's a teenager, and her and her little friend that that, um, that lives over there, they went out and they found these, and they they were so excited to get a hold of these because they thought, boy, isn't that something? And I said, how are you girls going to wear those? They said, we just put it on our head. I said, how? Because these girls are covering themselves up totally. The only thing you see is this slit, <laughs> and they're wearing black. So they put these gaps on top of their heads. <laughs> That's amazing. So I asked her if I could borrow it to do the program. And Alhamdulillah. No, we got that out of the way. Alhamdulillah, here the love me. We've been talking really with our Christian friends on the subject of true salvation. And so before I go any further, I want to do an inventory real quick. Do we have... Uh, for instance, right now, do we have any Muslims with us? Please raise your hand. Okay. Do we have any non-Muslims with us today? One, two, three, four non-Muslims? Wow. Oh, how do you like being surrounded by all these terrorists? <laughs> Feel good. Feel good, Ethan. <laughs> There's hope for you. Alhamdulillah. I really enjoy, I really enjoy being with all of you. When Dr. Prusalat was doing the introduction, I got tickled and I was trying to keep from laughing, not at him really, but because before, right before I went to Morocco, I happened to have been in Denver, Colorado and had to hurry from there to South Carolina and then catch the flight to Morocco. And there was one doctor there who wanted to be the one to take me around everywhere. And uh, we're riding around in his Lexus and going here and there and he's going to be sure that he's going to pick me up and he's going to drive me and he's going to get the reward with the law. He did such a good time uh, with us, we, we enjoyed it, but he, he was so good at being punctual, right on time, he'd get me here, get me there. So just before we left, and we're standing in front of all the people. I turned to him and I said, you know, doctor, I got some very good news for you. 
after observing the way you handled yourself, taking me around here and there, if this doctor thing doesn't work out for you, you can always get a job driving a taxi. And <laughs> It's nice to know you got back up, you know. <laughs> Blend B. <laughs> if the doctor thing doesn't work out. Oh, that hurts. Alhamdulillah. But let's now turn to our subject and think about this just for a minute. Because the human beings, we're all the same in some ways. We really are the same. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who creates everything. And there isn't anything except He created it. Now, most people believing in God would accept that up to this point. And there's nothing being sustained except that He's the sustainer. And again, most people would agree to that, what you're saying. According to the monotheistic face of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we all agree, according to the text, that there was one human being created first, a man, and God called him Adam. And we all even use the same word. No change in pronunciation from the Hebrew to the Aramaic, to the English, or to the Arabic. Adam. We all say Adam. It's strange, isn't it? Now, they've got different names for God, but we, get, we, we don't know who the God is, but we know who our father was. It's interesting. Because there are many names for God. The reason the Muslims use Allah is because it has meaning along with being Allah's name. It comes from a, a root in Arabic, Elah. Elah actually is something worshipped. Anything can be a worship. Uh, an Elah. Anything worshipped is an Elah. A rock, a stick, a stone, a bone. Anything that moves or doesn't move can still be an Elah. Even a concept can be an Elah. A God. Like the money in your pocket. Did you ever notice it says right on it, in God we trust. Everybody else pays cash. <laughs> now I'm going to have to use that other laugh track. I didn't get that. <laughs> in any case, what you worship <clears throat> depends on what your love or devotion or your desire is for. You can't say, I worship God, but at the same time, you're really worshiping something He created. Those are just words that you're using. And it's obvious what you really worship by what you really do. For instance, if a man's telling his wife how much he loves her, but he's spending all his time with some other ladies, that's uh, pretty obvious, isn't it? And uh, he won't do that long until she'll straighten him out anyway, but <laughs> the idea is that what you say with your mouth isn't necessarily what you're really doing with your life. And Islam is not a religion. Islam is not a religion. We say it, but that's not true. Because Islam is an action, it's a verb, it's what you do. Whereas religions are named after a person or a place or a thing. We're back to the noun again, right? There is, the word Islam is not the object of worship. You, it, it, like some of the brothers always say, Tell, teach us about Dawah, how to call people to Islam. I said, I don't know how. I don't have a clue. I can call the people to a law. But the way they get to Allah is through Islam. So calling the people to Islam doesn't make a whole lot of sense if they don't know what's the noun. Kind of like calling people to a highway, but you don't know where it goes. What will they do? What which way will they go on the highway? Right or left? Up or down? East or west? North or south? You're on the highway, but now what? And then even if you said it's that way and they started going after a while, they go, why am I doing this? Where am I going? To what extent is this? I'm traveling, traveling, traveling. I'm getting tired, you know. Maybe I'll just get off here and hang out or do this or do that. And it, it makes sense. If you understand what I just said, it makes sense that you have to call them to Allah first. So who is Allah? Why do you use this word Allah? Why don't you say God not like a normal guy does? <clears throat> Christians often think that everybody says God. It's a Christian. But it's not true. The majority of the Christians in the world don't use that word. We have a very narrow-minded idea of what the world is like because we always base it on the 30 miles that we grew up in. That's it. That's what we know. The majority of the Christians in the world today from one denomination are Catholic. If you want to take one denomination of Christianity, the number one is Catholic. 
And the majority of all the Catholics don't live in America. And the majority live where? In South America, Central America, Mexico, France, Italy, Spain. Did I name them? Not right? None of those languages use the word God. Dios and do. That's what they use. Whoops. Whoops. Well, you missed that one. Well, guess what else? Go to Russia. Go to Germany. Go to those European countries that you can't pronounce the name of. And look, they have Christians. And ask them, what do you call the one that you worship? And it's not the same name. True? True. Now, let's do the opposite. Uh, if you choose the country, I don't care which one it is, anyone you want. There's maybe, what, two or three hundred countries? I don't know how many there are. A bunch of them. Choose anyone you like. Go ahead. Choose the country. Italy. Italy? Okay, good. Choose the country. Nigeria. Nigeria, okay. Country. Uh, Russia. Russia? Russia? Yeah. Good country. India. India? Somebody? Huh? Palestine? Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Come on. China. 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 Okay. Now, every one of the countries named so far, what do the Muslims call their God? Allah. Allah. Akbar. Well, you didn't know I was going with that one, did you? <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered what country you said, would it? Is there any country in the world where, they, where Muslims don't know the word Allah? There are some countries that substitute, like in America we say God when we mean a law, but we're trying to translate for the other people. Afghanistan, parts of Iran and the northern part of, of um, Pakistan, they have, they say, Buddha Hafiz, God preserve you, but it should be Allah Hafiz, yes. but they're translating it. So it's a, but they know the law, but this is giving an example. So that if you want to know what's the best name to call the one and only God, let's examine the word and think about it. According to what we understand from the Bible, Old and New Testament, God is one. What we understand from the Quran, God is one. We don't have any argument on the subject of God being one. All of us would agree to that. There is reference to God is one. Now the word Elah can be made plural. Aliyah, gods, right? That, that's it, right? This is, this is my coach over here from my Arabia. <laughs> yeah, you got to keep on me. The only thing about when somebody from Egypt is teaching you Arabic, you got to be careful that when you go to the mosque at Ankuma. <laughs> Are you okay with this? The mom did a lot of with us today, those of you listening to this uh, broadcast. My runaway son is here. I found you, mashallah. He surprised me. By the way, don't keep this guy in your community. He's no good. No, send him back to me. I need Alhamdulillah. But when we're talking about this word Allah, I want to think about that a minute. It can be made plural. In English, you make God plural. You just put an S after it. God. Right? So. But when you say Allah, an amazing thing happens with this word. Because other words in Arabic, when you put Al in front of it, it means the, as opposed to a. Any old house, you say bait or baitun. But when you say al bait, that's the house. But you could say God, Elah, is God. A God, little g in English. Okay, they only got one word in English anyway. Little g, O D, a God. Right? But as gods, Elah, Aliha. Al-Ilah, the God, still a thing worshipped, and Al-Aliha, which is the gods. 
But a strange thing when you say Allah, this can't be made plural. It becomes unique because this particular word in Arabic cannot have two of them. Is that right? So already that perfectly fits one God because you can't make it two. And it's so powerful that when you say Allah to an Arab and understand what he's saying, he, there's no doubt in his mind you're not talking about something in your hand. You're talking about Allah, the God. Another unique thing about it, English is real clear. If you want to say female God, you say Goddess. A Goddess. She is a Goddess. Huh? But when you say Allah, it cannot be made female nor male. Doesn't have gender. Does not have gender. Now right away somebody's going to say, hold on a second. Then the Quran, how many times it said Allahu? Allahu means Allah he. That's masculine. It's right there. You stupid. Says it. This is not gender. This is out of respect. This is only out of respect instead of saying like it or something like that because Allah is having this big respect and honor and dignity and that also explains why you find we in the Quran. We does not mean plural. It's the royal we, like a king or queen. We decree the following decree and we are not amused and like that, you know. So, when I speak to you, I say, you are and I am. Why do I do that? When it's clear that we're individuals, one. And when you have a single, it's is. This is, that is, that is over there, he is, she is, is. Right? But when it's plural, two or more, it's are. You are, this is, they are, those guys are, these are, that, you know. So when it's plural, are. Singular, is. Now, by the way, we do have some of the boys with us right now that are is and they'd like to become are. <laughs> They're single and they'd like to become are. <coughs> you get that girl? We need to get these guys married off, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but when I speak directly to a person and I say you are and there's only one person there it's out of respect the language provides for that respect and when I say I is the only way that works is if I'm in certain parts of the south of the United States or Brooklyn you know? but otherwise if you understand the grammar you always say I am and you are and it's because of disrespect. It's the same thing in Arabic. <coughs> so when Allah says we, don't panic and go, oh my God, there may be, there is three gods in, you know, don't, don't do that. <laughs> That's a mistake some other people made with the Bible, okay? Because it does have the plural in the Bible as well, talking about we. It doesn't mean Allah and the angels, it means Allah, period, because there's no power beside Allah. There's no might, there's no power, there's no energy source, there is nothing but Allah. Now this brings us to an interesting question. Now. What about my free will? Don't I have any power here? Doesn't the devil have some kind of power? Isn't it? Does the devil have power? If he does, how much power does he have? Too much? And if he has power, could his power grow to the extent that he could overpower a law? No. Wait a minute, how do you know that? Wait a minute, what, what? think through what you just said. If you said he could have any power at all, you already have negated the fact that Allah is Al-Qawi. Is Allah Al-Qawi? The all-powerful? Yes. Meaning what? Or in any way else got any power. And if somebody has any power, how much do they have? And what would be the limit on it? And how could they get more? And maybe if one bad person or another, and they could add it up all together until all oh, so much bad, it could overpower God. <laughs> huh? 
All of a sudden, you're starting to think about Star Wars. Yes, Luke, may the force be with you! <laughs> Give it a rest. Think about it. That's not the teaching in Islam. That's the teaching in Christianity. The devil has power in Christianity. Oh, yeah. And especially in Hinduism. Oh, my And Taoism is the equal amount of white good on top and black bad on the bottom. Why is black always associated with bad? You ever wonder about that? <laughs> I think white people came up with that idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Louis Farrakhan turned it around the other way. <laughs> <laughs> He said, God is black. <laughs> Holy <Holding> the <his> love. <laughs> but think about it. Where is this power coming from? Do you have any power? Ask yourself, do I have power? If I have power, what kind of power do I have? And think real hard about this one. Do I have willpower? Oh. I think I have willpower. Maybe. If I want something, can I make it happen just by willing it? No. 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 Yes or no? No. No. no? no. If I can, what do I need God for? But then if I don't have any willpower, that means everything is from the law. Why should I get punished if I do something fall? wrong because it would be his fault, right? <laughs> so how can I solve this one? And by the way, this actually happens to be one of the principal tenets of Islam without which you can't be a Muslim. Listen up. There are six areas of belief essential to Islam and they're mentioned in two different hadiths. One is... Uh, uh, they're both they're called the Hadith of Jibril. They're very similar. One has uh, doesn't mention Hajj in it. Another one does. Right? You know what I'm talking about. I'm rambling around here, but I didn't lose you yet, did I? Okay. When they ask Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is Islam? And he said, Islam is to bear witness to La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Salawat al Qams, pray five times a day. I should obey the law. He said that last. And he, and he mentioned the uh, Psalm Ramadan, Zakat the Mall. You know all about what's the five pillars of Islam. But well, they said, what is he man? That was a separate question. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man is to believe in Allah. Wa malaya katihi is angels. Wa katubihi is what? Books. Rasulihi is prophets and or the Yom Kiyama, which is the Day of Judgment and Kabbalah to Law. What is Kabbalah? On the good side. It says, uh, in the uh, in, uh, in, uh, Is that right? Where is that? Is it in the Quran? What is that? Night of power. Night of power, right? Why did you use the word power? Does the night have power? No. Mm. Mm. Or is it meaning preordination? It's actually the night of preordination that it was written. If that's the night it's going to come down on, and he sent down, and so that down sent down this wahi or the Quran. Now. I have to believe in it or I can't be a Muslim. Prophet just said that in the famous Hadith of Jerusalem. But what is that? It means, according to the Prophet who tells us, that everything was written before Allah created. You are sitting exactly in the chair, in the place, in Fort Worth, Texas, that was written for you before Allah created the first Adam. Ouch. He knew. He wrote it. He caused it to be written. It says the first thing that Allah created was what? A pen. And he ordered the pen to write. And the pen wrote. Until the pen wrote everything that was going to happen from the beginning to the end. And the pen is put up and the ink is dry. 
It's really important to know this. This is not just some kind of passing fancy. We're just going to discuss, okay, next subject. We're going to talk about praying five times a day. No. This is real key because today we have so many of our youth and new Muslims that are confused on this issue. And it's a part of Islam and you don't have salvation in Islam without this. I'm serious. You have zero power. Get this in your mind. <clears throat> you don't have any power. Whatever you thought before you entered this room, throw it away. You have no power. The devil has no power. Nothing created by Allah has any power whatsoever. Everything is in total and complete submission to Allah 24-7. Always. Allah does not share his power with anything he created. La sharika la. La sharika la. There are no partners with Allah. This is very key. Very key to understanding who is Allah. Does he have partners? No. no. If anybody makes partners with Allah, does he mind? Yes. yes. A little bit or a whole lot? A whole lot. Yeah. What did he say in the Quran? He said he is our Rahman, our Rahim, our Gufur. I'm going to give you those three right there. Those are the ones I like. I know he's al -Alim. he knows everything, that's why I need the others of the four yes, because he knows what I did. I know he sees everything, he hears everything, again, I need to go back to his forgiveness and his mercy and his compassion. I need that for my salvation, right? But along the way I found out he is, oh, and he is the one who has all power. Is he out of here? Is that right? It means he has own. I mean, he's it. When Allah has a name, it doesn't mean he has something. He has all of it. And it's so total that he cannot have the opposite of it. Is Allah al Hai? What does that mean? He's al Hai, Allah. Now I'm going to show you something. Watch this. Pay attention. Somebody comes up to you. So you believe in God, huh? Yeah. What do you call God anyway? Allah. Oh, you believe in Allah, okay. Can can your God, can your Allah, can he do anything? Oh, I must have really affected you guys. You were afraid to move, they're going, don't move. <laughs> don't say yes, don't say no. This guy's blowing my brains out here. Alright. Can God do anything? Yes. No. No. Don't say yes. Let's say yes. But you're going to find out something, man. You're going to be surprised at the answer to this one. Can God do anything? God goes, yeah, sure, God can do anything. Anything. Is there anything God can't do? Absolutely not. If it, if he can do it. Can he die? No. But you said he can do anything. Oh. Because when you ask a Christian, he'll go, oh, uh, yeah, I guess he can die. Sure, he's on the cross. He's on the cross. Yeah, of course he can. Oh, stop. Oh, Lord. <laughs> what happened to Ohio? Say God can do anything? Can he take the form of a human being and walk on the earth? Christian's gonna jump up right away. Yeah, 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 that's right. He did that. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but watch what happens. If you follow this thought, watch what will happen. So God can do anything? Anything? Nothing that he can't do. Can he make a rock so big? Nothing can lift it? You go, that, yeah, sure. Even he can't lift it? Oops. Now what are you going to do? We, uh, we got this big rock out here, and now we can't move it, because even God can't move it. Now we can't go anywhere. You got a rock in the way. You <laughs> <laughs> messed up, man. No, he can move it. Wait a minute. He can move it? This means he can't make a rock so big that he can't move it. How are you going to answer that one? The reason you got stuck is because you said Allah can do anything, and that's not the teaching of Islam. It says, Allahu ala kulli shayin qadir. And then they translate it, Allah can do anything. But that's not the Arabic, is it? Allah is capable, has the power to do whatever He wills to do. But He would never will to not be Allah anymore. Therefore, he never wills to be dead. 
because he's not white. He never wills to be oppressive because they'll ask you, can Allah lie, cheat, oppress? Of course not, because that would be against his name's adul, which is to be totally just and fair, merciful, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So we understand that Allah is perfect in all his attributes, but he doesn't have attributes of things that negate the other attributes. Got it? He gives life and he gives death, but he doesn't die. He creates, but he's not created. And by the way, while we're on the subject of his names, is there such a thing as evolution, yes or no? Again, I got you so scared, don't move. Don't even move. Is there such a thing as evolution? Evolution meaning to change from one thing to another. Is there evolution evolving in stages? from this to that. Is there such a thing? Yes. Yes. No. Do we have any doctors here? Does any doctors here know about gynecology? Anybody know about babies, uh, uh, this embryology, anything like that? Do babies change from stage to stage? Yes. Do they evolve? Yes. So there's evolution. Yes or no? Yes. Can people come from monkeys? No. Are you sure? Yes. My brother-in-law really looks on the <laughs> Are you caught? No. <laughs> He's in another part of Texas, don't worry. <laughs> if there's creation, who's the creator? Uh-uh. Don't say one. Say his name. The name of the one who's the creator. If there's creation, I'll call that. And if there's evolution, I'll bother you. The shaper, the evolver. Huh. We're the only religion that teaches both creation and evolution at the same time. If there's creation, I'll call that. If there's evolution, I'll bother you. Next question. Oh. What about that big rock we got out here in the parking lot? You gonna move that for me? Oh yeah, let's come back to the big rock. It can God make a rock so big that nothing can move it? The answer is absolutely yes. He can do that. Even he can't move it, Allah doesn't do that. Allah doesn't move stuff. He doesn't roll up his sleeves and go out here and go, okay, okay, take deep breaths, keep your back straight, knees are up. Oh, oh, oh. That's not how it works. This thing's heavy, you know. <laughs> When Allah wants anything done, He said it in the Bible. And He said it in the Quran, both the same words exactly, only one's in English, the other one's translated into English. Kun by a kun. Be. And it is. If He wants it somewhere else, He'll just say, Kun by a kun. And He'll move. He'll do what He said to do. Is that true? You put God into creation, you lost everything. Comparing to the creation, you're wiped. And these Born again idiots will come and attack you on that point and they're stupid to come and attack us because we're the ones that can help them prove the point they're trying to prove and they're cutting down their own belief. Can you believe a believer will come to you and try to tell you there's no God because essentially that's what you're trying to say. And all they got left to say is after you go through it say, well, what do you say? After these questions, you can't answer them. Ah, oh, God is a mystery. I'm wondering if he's from Egypt. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> but it's from Egypt where they had the scholar who ruled that riba, interest, usury, is haram. Everybody already knows that. It's in the Quran. Allah declares harb. Be a prize, be aware of harb, war, from Allah and his messenger against you and you deal in riba. So they brought a particular situation to the sheikh and he said, this is haram, and he wrote a fatwa and gave it to them. Well then, some years later, they brought almost the same words back to him again, and this time he said halal and gave it to them. So they went, whoa, sheikh, you said this was haram and now you said it's halal. He said, oh, but riba is a mystery of mysteries Surrounded in a mystery. <laughs> and they made him mufti of Egypt. <laughs> true or false? It's true. 
<laughs> what a great guy. <laughs> Solved all our problems. Hey, it's a mystery. What can I say? The Monday. Well, I want to come back now to our subject. When we talk about a law and the cutter, you don't have any will. So how is it it's fair for me to be punished and it was written before I was even created? Now, I don't mind the part where I get rewarded. Okay, I don't mind that part. But I'm worried about this punishment stuff over here. And if you said that it's already written, then I can't help it. You know, I'm just a jerk because that's what was written for me. Can't help it. I don't wear a hijab because that's what's written for me. I can't help it. <laughs> and if you fall for that, you know who you just you just became partners with? Iblis. Because he said the reason I didn't make such that is because Allah. Allah. He blames Allah. Blaming Allah why he didn't do what he was ordered to do. He said, how can I? You didn't write it for me. Whoa. And by the way, he's absolutely right. It is not written for him. He can never do it. He can't. But Allah said he could. Because Jesus, alayhi salam, asked Allah, could he please, the devil, could he make trouble? Could he repent? And if he did, would you forgive him? And Allah said, yes, yes. Yes, he could do it. Yes, I'll forgive him. He said, but I already know he won't. So it's written, but it's not Allah's fault. The reason it's written is because this pen, when it wrote, it wrote what's going to happen, not based on Allah saying, okay, this is just the way it is, tough luck. It's because he gave us an amazing thing, not free will. You don't have free will. What you have, you have free choice. There's a difference. Will means you can make it happen. Allah has will. Can you make anything happen you want to happen? Huh? Why don't you just order us all up a brand new BMW or a Mercedes with the keys and the motors running and oh, and a huge tank full of gas at these prices. <laughs> or let it run on butane or something, right? But for sure, for sure Allah can cause whatever He wants to happen. Without doubt. Is that true? So, okay, now we understand. All you have is choice. You're not going to be judged on what happened as much as the choice you made. Because you could choose to do good and it might not happen. You still have the reward. Or you could choose to do something bad and it may not come about. But you still wanted it to happen, didn't you? So Allah is only judging you on that. Although He already knows, so that makes Him the perfect judge. Allah the Allah will be a time of hakimi. Who is the better judge than Allah? Nobody, but there's your judge. But he's not being unfair. He gave you the choice. He knows, but you don't. Do you know what you're going to do later? I don't know. Make your choice. Make a choice right now. Because you don't know if you're going to live till later, do you? This is why I always encourage people looking at Islam, don't drag your feet. Don't hold up, because you don't know if you're going to live from now to just a little bit later. Alhamdulillah, it happened that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he gave shahada to a young boy, and the boy died within minutes. That's true. <clears throat> a young boy, a teenage kid probably, who was Jewish, Prophet Sallallahu was visiting him, he was sick, told him, you better say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The boy looked at his father, his father nodded his head and said, Obey Abu Qasim. That was the name of uh, the like, nickname of Kunya the Prophet he said, Ashad wa la ilaha la Muhammad Rasulullah. And then he died. And the Prophet Sallallahu became very happy. Why would he be so happy? Because he said, this is somebody saying, for save, salvation from the fire of hell. But the Prophet Sallallahu doesn't know who's going to make shahara and who isn't going to make shahara. If that's true, if, he, if the Prophet Sallallahu could do it, he would have done it with his uncle. True? Yes. I tell you. Did he try to give him the dawah before he died? Yeah. And this is somebody who liked Muslims. This is not like Mr. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no offense. I mean, we love the president. <laughs> He's from Texas, too. <laughs> hey, don't be laughing at Texas. Don't laugh at Mr. Bush. But let me tell you something. 
Eisenhower was born in Texas. That's right. Kansas. You know Eisen? Eisenhower? Kansas. You know? He's buried in Kansas. Who cares what he's buried in? He's born in the air. <laughs> then another president from Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And then another president, the first Bush. Yep, we sent one by one by one and we sent Mr. Bush and then we sent a son of a Bush. Clinton was in office, I used to have to work to make up the jokes that were printed around Mr. Clinton. But I love Bush. I, I, I get an easy laugh. I just walk out on the stage and I go, <coughs> Bush. And everybody cracks up. <laughs> I don't get it. Anyway, we talk about we talk about this clutter of the law because we want to understand how does it work. We want to understand how do I fit in this picture. And we're actually looking for a loophole to get out so we don't have to pay for what we did. And in some religions, they get out of it by praying to other things other than Allah and asking a frog to forgive them. Okay? I wonder, do they kiss those frogs in, in, in India? I don't know. They pray to them. Pray to everything. You know in those stories, a girl kisses a frog, it turns into a prince. Yeah. Over there, they pray to rats. I wonder what happens when you kiss a rat. <laughs> I saw it. By the way, I'm not joking. I was in India. If I was there just in time for El Tsunami. <laughs> it happened. They did. Right when we were there, I was in Bangalore on the day it hit. The next day, I was in Chennai, which used to be Madras. And, that, and we were right there and we saw the effects of it. unbelievable. Anyhow, I want to mention that uh, while we were there, the Hindus did a lot of the work for our big exhibition they had. It was a huge thing, needed a lot of people. So a lot of the people working, the laborers and everything, and drivers were Hindus. So they sent a, a Hindu driver to pick me up at the hotel to take me to the convention, to the exhibition. And when I got in the car, I slammed the door of the car when I got in. You get in on the wrong side. If you, ever, you know that about India, they drive on the wrong side of the road. Yeah. The steering wheel's over on there, and I'm looking like, this doesn't work, you know? I get in, I slam the door, and right over the driver's wheel, he's got a little thing on the dashboard about, about six inches tall, a little fat-looking thing there, and it wiggled. <laughs> it's a, like a little shrine, it's got something in it. And I said, what's that? He said, it's my God. I said, what kind of God is that? He says, it's the God for me traveling. When I travel, this God right here, you know, this is the God for traveling. I said, he takes care of you? He said, yeah. So this God is protecting you while you travel? He said, yeah. I said, well, I'll tell you what you do. Did you see how he moved when I slammed the door? You better put a seatbelt on him. <laughs> Because we're going to hit a bump out here and your guys are going to move flying out the window. <laughs> Dr. Jaffer, the shape of trees, was sitting in the back seat. Now this is one of my big teachers in Akita. Sitting in the back seat. And he was trying to keep from falling on the floor laughing. Because he knew exactly what I did. But I kept a straight face. You know what I said? I'm serious about this. I'm really worried about your God. I don't want to fall down on the floor and you're trying to drive and your foot stepping on him instead of the floor. Please put a seatbelt on your <laughs> And he reached over and he grabbed his God and he picked it up real hard and I heard, he said, no problem, look, Velcro. <laughs> Lord of modern age we live in, I'll humble you now you can put Velcro on your guys. <laughs>
For us, it's Muslim, it's like obvious. Hello! <laughs> You're worshiping other than Allah, man! And if the God can fall on the floor, or if he needs a seatbelt, or if it breaks, how are you going to ask him for anything? Why don't you pray to the Rabbi Bahami? Pray direct to the God. Be responsible for what you do. Don't lay your sins off on somebody else. That's what happened to the Christians. They needed somebody to lay everything off onto. I'm a sinner. I'm bad, man. I can't live up to all the stuff I did. God's going to punish me, man. Oh, wait a minute. An innocent person could go to the cross, right? And they could take all my sins for me. Hey, great idea. As long as you're going, by the way, as you pass it back, if you're going to the cross, are you? Okay, take some of these. Here, take them all. Here we go. But I got an email. I got an email from a Christian. We've been on my websites. Our website is islamtomorrow.com. Islam yesterday, Islam always, dot com. You see how I sneak those commercials in there? <laughs> <laughs> he sent me an email and he said, I like your website, I like the stuff you said, I love everything in Islam except one thing. I said, well, that's what I want. I don't believe it. What is, what's his problem? <laughs> he said, I would love to be a Muslim except for one thing. He said, I cannot believe in a God. I can't believe in a God that would be so horrible that he would do what I saw on the website. And what we had on the website is one theory. It's only a theory that some people have. <coughs> because we know Jesus did not go on the cross. We know that. Because it says it real clear in the cross. He didn't go. But, but they've been arguing about it ever since. About what really happened. Now some people said that the meaning is that somebody else went to the cross. But it doesn't say that in Arabic. Does it? No. Does it say somebody else went to the cross or looked like Jesus? No. It says they've been arguing about it. That's it. Period. Alright. But some have said maybe it was like Judas Thomas Iscariot who was the one that sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver and maybe he went to the cross because he looked like him. His name being Thomas. That was one of his names, Judas Thomas Iscariot. And Thomas is from the Arabic, Aramaic word Tawam which means twin dead ringer, looked like Jesus, went to the cross, and that would explain why he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthan, my God, my God, why have you done this to me? Jesus wouldn't have said that. No prophet would say that, because they know the color of the law. A believer never, ever curses God. Never. No matter what happens to them, they say, alhamdulillah, and they make supper, and they're basic, and it's good for them but it's only in the case of a believer. Whoever died on that cross saying, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani could not have been any prophet or any believer whatsoever because it's not the statement of a dying person believing in God. He would have said, Alhamdulillah, this is what Allah has for me. And if it was the true plan of salvation, somebody should have clued him in on it because he obviously didn't know about it. So this guy's writing me a letter. He didn't like the fact that somebody mentioned that it could have been somebody other than Jesus. And listen to his words. Listen to his words. He said, I don't want a God that would be so cruel as to put an innocent man in the place of somebody else. And I wrote back to him and I said, Welcome to Islam. Because we're with you 100%. It's not our religion that teaches that an innocent man went to the cross to die for the sins of others. He wrote back again, Asharu la ilaha Last night, alhamdulillah, a, a gentleman that had spent the day with us at the open house over in Arlington was very, very knowledgeable in the Bible. He knew a lot more about it than I did because he's read it in the Jewish and in the Aramaic. He's studied so many manuscripts and he was bringing arguments that, it, that only because of Allah, Allah guided me I could give him answers to because it was very technical things that he was mentioning. But the key keeps coming back to this. We do have the original and you don't. Bottom line, you don't have the original and we do. Wake up and smell the cup. Guess what? Allah guided me last night. 
Hajj right after the Salah. The Imam was reading in the Salah something that I had been talking about, about the condition of the human being, how ungrateful we really are. And he was reading from the Quran and everybody started crying. You know what happens in Ramadan? Usually people start crying out loud, oh, 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 like, you know, really crying in the Salah. And then he read another story in Juzama. I can't, I, I can't do it. I just tell you that it's very powerful because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O mankind, how could you be so ungrateful to your Lord? Who created you in the form or shape that he was. How could you be so ungrateful? And Allah is saying this to us. And right then, all the brothers in the front row was crying, and I'm sobbing, and mom was choking up, and I was thinking that all of a sudden, I thought about this man, he's sitting there watching us, and he's probably wondering, what are these guys doing, man? What's this? And so when it was over, as soon as we finished the salah, salam alaikum, salam alaikum, I tried to look over to see where was he? And I couldn't see him. And I said, darn, he got away. I just wanted one more shot at this guy. Because I felt like, you know, he was so close. Well, then, of course, you know, people come around and everything started moving. And I couldn't get back there. And I tried. It, it takes me, after Juma, by the way, it takes about one half hour to walk to the door. Because I can't. And hugging and shaking hands and, you know, all this stuff. Alhamdulillah. So, within about 15 minutes, though, I heard... The Imam on the microphone somewhere or some, I heard say Shadow with Ayy Lai Law and I heard I heard somebody saying Shadow Lai Law. I said, What's this? And they were saying, Allah Wai Bar, Allah Wai Bar. I said, Who? Who makes Shahada? Who makes Shahada? They said, You remember that guy in the sitting back there you told him to move closer? I said, Yeah, they said he just made Shahada. Alhamdulillah, I wrote a lot of me who allowed the channel to listen to Another person? Stay from the fire hell. What does it take to be a Muslim? Do you have to get registered in a mosque and then fill out a form? You do in the church. When I wanted to be confirmed in the church, I had to fill out some paperwork, and my mother had to sign it, and then I had to do all this kind of stuff and say this and say that, and then they want to put you in the water and come out of there, and then you got to get a towel and all that stuff. But anyway, but what's cool is now on Sunday when they pass the cracker and the juice, you can drink it because you can't do that before you're confirmed. You know. But you know what? To be a Muslim, as soon as somebody comes to you and says, you know, I'd like to be a Muslim, but I need to know what to do first. You know what the answer is? Guess what? You already are. You already there. Because you don't need to prove anything to me, do you? Do you? What, what do I need? I don't need anything from you. Allah, the one that you love, the one that you cherish, the one that you're devoted to, the one that you will sacrifice everything you have to be with in the next life, He already knows how you feel. The only reason you're saying it out loud is to join the community so you can suffer along with us while we're waiting to get to it. <laughs> but you do need to say your Shabbat, and it's not that hard. Now, anybody here doesn't know Arabic, raise your hand. You don't know Arabic. But, okay, let's put it this way. If you don't know how to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, I'll raise your hand. Okay? Anybody can't say that? Everybody can say that? Okay. If you find a crowd and they have somebody that can't, just tell them it's like when a baby, a newborn baby can say the shahada. Do you know that? A newborn baby can say the shahada. A newborn baby can't say Trinity, by the way. <laughs> but they can say shahada. Watch. Watch the baby laying there. He's laying there, sometimes the sun's coming in on him, you know, and they're looking at the little things in front of him, and they're going, ah, ah. <laughs> Right or wrong? I mean, ladies, am I right? Babies, and it doesn't matter. You speak Urdu, the baby still says, la, la, la. You speak Arabic, la, la, la. English, la, la. Babies say that all the time, don't they? La, la. And then, Sometimes they hit them. Uh, they I'm stretching that. La ilaha. You're Allah. La ilaha. You're Allah. La means no. It's easy to learn this in Arabic. Why? Go to any Arab home where they have children. And you'll learn the word no immediately. Yeah. That, that, 
salvation and it's the only salvation it's mentioned in the Bible it's mentioned in the New Testament and it's mentioned in the Quran the same thing one God worship him without any partners thou shalt not have any other gods beside me if you believe that and you mean it and you understand that Muhammad is one of those messengers who brought that message the last of the messengers then you need to acknowledge that if you're really serious otherwise you're just taking up good breathing space and if you believe it now say it Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an muhammad and this is the most love you'll ever have for Jesus is when you follow him because he told you real clear worship my God and your God my Lord and your Lord he never said I'm God worship me that. Understand that people manipulate religion for political and financial reasons and they use and they abuse people all the time but don't abuse yourself if you haven't accepted Islam this is your chance I know we have some visitors maybe you feel under pressure you don't want to do it that's fine it's up to you but I'm going to make it real easy for you because I'm going to ask the Muslims if you have never made shahada in public or you want to reconfirm your shahada right now, then stand up with me right now and let's say the shahada. <laughs> Catch up real fast. <laughs> now if you find yourself sitting down, ask yourself, what is it that I don't want to declare there's only one God? Why don't I want to confirm all the messengers who came before? Why, when I got this chance, this is my best chance to declare my belief in this one God. Here's your chance. Can't make it easier for you than this. But we'll start in English. I bear witness. I bear witness. There's only one God worthy to worship. And I bear witness. Muhammad is his servant. Is that hard? It's pretty easy. Now, if you really meant it, then say it again. Only so in Arabic. Arabia. Ashadu. An la ilaha. An la ilaha. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. An Muhammad. An Muhammad. Rasulullah. Now, from the takbir, takbir, la wa ilaha. That's good, but we got that other one. Guess what, guys? Yeah. Everybody in this room who really meant that right then, I'm asking Allah, please Allah, accept this shahara from every one of us. Forgive us from whatever we did before up to this point. Let us have a new lease. Let us have another chance. Give me another chance, Allah, because really, 
I want to try again. You know, walk out that door, it's not the same person that walked in. And I've got another lease on my life. I want to go out and do what you want me to do. And this is my chance. I ask about to accept that from you, me, and all of us. Um, out there. I want to close by just making a little prayer in English and translate to Arabic or the other way around. And it's asking for the very best from Allah for you and this whole community. For this life. And then the very best from Allah for you and this whole community for the next life and salvation from the punishment of His fire. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasmi wa fi lakhirti hasmi wa fi nada min arami. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim in akhamid al majid. Ameen. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen who Allah di jamal al muslimin. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for letting me come home to be with all of you again after so many years. And I especially thank Allah for letting me see my wayward son again and for being with all of you on this great occasion and this day. I thank Allah for this beautiful day. And there's a passage also in the Bible, by the way, that this is the day that the Lord has made and we should rejoice in it. It's good for all of us. It's good for all of us to remember that day. This is another chance for us. And I hope, inshallah, Allah accept from all of you. Jazakum Allah khayran wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa up from the ladies section and they translated it to Arabic for him. He said a short statement and all the Arabs broke out dying laughing. It was really hysterical. I'm going, what's so funny? Finally, after it calmed down, they translated the question and answer. They said the, que they said the question from the lady, <laughs> the, que <laughs> like this, the question from the lady is asking about the hijab for the women. The dress that they were. So then the Sheikh said, my answer is the same answer as the last Sheikh that you had. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't quite get the full value of that until I, until I started traveling around and this question came up over and over and over. But it was Imam Shawaj that gave that answer that I laughed the hardest at. Two sisters, American sisters, encountered him when he got off the stage one time and they said, Imam! <laughs> Our American sisters sing <laughs> What did it say in the Quran? A lady got away with hijab. He said it caught him off guard so much he went, huh? Oh. <laughs> uh, he said, wait a minute. 
Your sisters make a lot. They said, no. He said, you got a much bigger problem than you. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't pray, what are you worry about? If you're the lost for I love the right side. Make it awkward, please. But anyway, um, when it comes to the question and answer thing, I decided at one point, I think I'll just sat through all of it for you. Save you writing it down, sending it up, and having it. Put your hand in the microphone and up. So, hey, Jeff. Do women have to wear a hijab? And the answer is no, they don't. Just stay home. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> brother? Brother? Yes. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> is it true all Muslims have to grow their beard? No, the ladies don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a problem. What's your problem? My wife, she, she don't like me to have a beard. I have to shave it because my wife doesn't like it. So you got to wonder about a woman that likes her husband to look like another woman. <laughs> That's called. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> But brother, what? Make go up for me. What? Make go up for me, I'll grow my beard. I can't. Huh? That's shirt. No, I said make go up that I'll grow my beard. I can't. That's shirt. Allah grows your beard. I'll make go up, you quit cutting it off. <laughs> I guess one of the funniest ones happened to me years ago when I used to have a march to John Centennial. There were all foreign students coming over here to learn English, Defense Language Institute. <coughs> Amazing how uh, this, being here brings all that back in my mind, you know. And they always talk about talking. This one thing about a Muslim, they're always talking about everything is from the law, the color of the law, how we think about a law. So it's always mentioning a law. He's one, he's unique, he's the only one to worship. We just, it's like daily conversation with us. We're consumed with that. I'll do that. But this is funny because here's, and I'm still pretty new in Islam, and this brother's telling me about in Islam, you can only worship Allah. He said, yes. All ibadah, all ibadah, worship. It's for Allah. You need anything, you have to ask Allah. Only Allah. Nobody else. Nothing else. Okay, got it. Okay. And he said, Jazakallah khair, brother, you're new to Islam. Jazakallah khair, because you're so close to Allah, because you just accepted Islam. Please, please, please. <laughs> please pray to me. <laughs> How many of you are Arab? Do you know what that means? <laughs> it means pray for me. <laughs> he said, pray to me. But in closing, I want to I want to say something for our youth here. I think it's something important for you guys. So sit up, pay attention. It's very important. I want to teach you a lesson. Lesson. Be real serious, okay? Because you're young, you don't know some of these things. You got to pay attention. You listening? I'm serious, guys. Okay. One thing that's important in Islam is knowledge. Knowledge is very important. In fact, you can't get through life if you don't know anything, right? So you want to focus on the right kind of knowledge. And the knowledge of knowing where the remote control for the TV is, is not the one I'm talking about. <laughs> Talk about some serious knowledge. And there are many ways to get it. You come to the masjid, you sit with the imam, you learn about the Quran, and you talk to your parents and you listen to your parents. All of this is part of gaining knowledge. But a lot of stuff you get in the public school is not knowledge, okay? It's garbage shape. <laughs> That's French for crap. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anyway, be sure you get the right kind of knowledge. And along the way, always remember to eat a lot of brain. The best kind of food to eat for your brain. That's what it is. 
Yes. Yes. So take good care. Take responsibility. Big responsibility. And this is something very beautiful when somebody enters into this not this. It's an amazing thing. Now, what happens when you see somebody come into Islam and all of a sudden they burst into tears? Have you wondered what's happening? Because you guys didn't see this, but I've been in prisons with some very big guys, okay? Very mean, got scars on their face, tattoos all over them and everything. And then they're saying, yeah, I want to be a Muslim. <laughs> and you're going, okay. And they come up to you and they start to give shahada. And all of a sudden they just break down. Tears falling down from their face and they're shaking like there's an earthquake. And everybody's staring at me going, that's Billy Bob, man. <laughs> What's happening? Because there's something that is really physically happening to a person when they enter into Islam. And anybody who did this knows exactly what I'm talking about. And it always gets me every time. Because I can go back and remember how it felt when I did it. Because when a person chooses to enter into the submission of Allah, He bestows down upon them a mercy from Himself, or as it's called in Arabic, Rahmah, min Allah. And when this Rahmah descends down, it is so powerful. It is so powerful. And this is talking about like Layla Qadr, when this, this comes down, and they feel this thing, you can't, you can't explain it. But it takes away all of the sins that the person has committed from day one up to that very minute. All is forgiven. Everything. The clean slate, but it's not left blank for long because an equal weight of good deeds is heaped on here to offset so that they have piles and piles of nothing but good deeds. Forgiven by Allah, no bad deeds, mountains of good deeds, virgin like a newborn baby. You start over, totally clean. This is what was mentioned by John the Baptist. This is what was mentioned by the Prophet Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him. And it was mentioned by Muhammad, peace be upon him, the same way and it says that when a person enters into Islam, when a person comes into the fold of submission to God to do his will on earth as it is in heaven, then they are like they are newborn, fresh from their mother. Just like newborn. And certainly when you're newborn, you have a feeling about that, wouldn't you? That's a pretty amazing thing to come into the world. And so this is what happens. This is why you see even tough people suddenly going and crying because it's for real. Some of you know the story and some of you don't. But it was right here, right here in Fort Worth, Texas, right close to here, actually called Middle Othean. You know where it's Middle Othean? Yeah. yeah. I had to make a decision because one night the Catholic priest who was living with us had gone to the mosque right over here in Arlington on Center Street. He went in there with this Arab friend of mine named Muhammad. And when he came back that night, he was wearing a thobe and a kufi. And I said, this is Father Peter Jacobs. <laughs> Did you become a Muslim? And he said, I grabbed my camera, I used to have a TV show, so I grabbed my camera, I set up the tripod, I got everything going, got the lights out, the microphones. I said, I'm going to interview him. This is going to be an amazing thing for anybody. I remember I was still Christian, and I'm telling him, please give us some sense of the idea. What is it like to be a Catholic priest, and now you're a Muslim? And he fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, oh well. But I couldn't get it out of my mind, and I went upstairs. We lived in my father's house in Great Big. And I was upstairs. I was telling my wife, when I had that was Christian, I said, can you imagine a Catholic priest 
I mean, he gave up everything because the Catholic priest, you know, Catholic priest, he doesn't have a wife, he doesn't have a family, he's nothing, it's the church, and that's it. And he gave up 14 years of being in Mexico, South America, Central America, as an evangelist type priest for them, one who is really working for the sake of the church. And he accepted this Immediately the church excommunicates him, you know that. God's all communication with God means you're going to hell, according to them. I was telling my wife about this, and in the middle of me talking to her about this, she said, I want a divorce. And I went, huh? Well, there's a shocker on the with me. Hold on. I got seven and a half years invested in this lady and two little kids, and I've been through that divorce thing before in the state of Texas, and you don't want to know what that is. And I'm going, no, 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 no. <laughs> Well, what's the problem? She said, well, it's all this talk about this man, religion, etc., etc., and I've decided now I can't be married to you anymore. I said, well, well, why? She said, you heard what he said, a Muslim can't be married to a Christian. I said, well, first of all, did I say I want to be a Muslim? I did not say I want to be a Muslim. Just to preach my knees, I do not want to be a Muslim. Okay? Okay? Are you okay? Because I don't. That's the furthest thing for me is to be a Muslim. Okay? I like it. And then, I mentioned to her, and he didn't say Muslims can't marry Christians. What he said was that a Muslim woman can't be married to a Christian man, okay? So, she said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> now, this old redneck, still hard-headed, going, huh? She said, I want to become a Muslim. Oh, it just hit me now like it hit me then, and it's enough. I was sitting on the edge of the bed, and I almost fell off because I realized, oh my God, how close I was because I wanted to tell her anyway. So here's my chance. I said, well, wait, there's good news. There's good news here. Okay? The good news is, I too want to be a Muslim. I was so excited, you know? Look! We'll be Muslims together! You know what I don't want to do with everything? She said, I'm going to you. I said, no, I'm serious. She said, you're a liar. I said, no, I'm telling the truth. She said, you are a liar either way. I said, what do you mean? She said, either you're lying right now or you were lying five minutes ago when you said you didn't want to be Muslim. Make up your mind. <laughs> I couldn't say another word, but she said, just take yourself and get out. I'm halfway down the steps to the bottom part of my father's house, and I'm going, wait a minute, where am I going? This is my brother's house! <laughs> <laughs> I went downstairs, it was after one o'clock in the morning by now, something like this, and great. Then I went down and I woke up Mohammed, our friend, you know, and I said, man, you brought this stuff in my house. Get up. <laughs> We're going to talk. Let's go outside. He told me later, by the way, he has a belt, black belt karate. He told me later he thought I wanted to fight. <laughs> I just wanted to talk to him, you know. But when we got out there and we started talking and I started trying to understand, I understand there's only one God. I understand. Why can't we just like, you know, isn't there some like way to compromise this thing a little bit? Can't we just like, okay, God is one and, and, and mom is his brother, but can't we just, I mean, you know, the church, I, what am I supposed to do? I'm in the music business, 38 years, what am I going to do? All oh, these pianos, the organs, guitars, all this stuff, and, and you know, said, everything is the best up in Islam. You come into Islam and step, I said, what have you wonder? One by one. One by one. Do you believe there's only one God? I said, yeah. Then declare that. And let him take you to the next step. I said, okay, it's one God. He said, you believe mom is his messenger? I said, I don't know, that's the part, I don't get it, you know. How, I don't, I know about Jesus. He said, well, fine. Did Jesus say that another person would come after him? Called the comforter, the paraclete, the counselor, the advocate? Yeah. Did he say he would be the spirit of truth? Yeah. Did he say he would make all things known? Yeah. That he would bear witness to the testimony of Jesus? Yeah. Muhammad fits every bit of that. Exactly. He did all of that. And he was even named a Sadiq, which means the spirit of truth. Really? 
And you don't have to know Muhammad personally to accept the message that he brought. The message is worship God and not anything else. It's not asking you to worship him. It's not like the Trinity deal where you got to pick out which one of the three you're going to worship. So we talked until the sun started to come up. We started walking back to the house. And I knew he has to go pray. And I decided, you know, it's time for me to do something about what I'm talking about. I went out behind my father's house and I found a piece of plywood back underneath a little overhang. And I tried to estimate me. He aims his head this way when he prays. So let me do that. Put my head down in that direction on that piece of plywood. With my head down on the ground, I said, I don't know what to do, really. It came in my mind. And I said, oh God, if you're there, guide me. I couldn't think of nothing else to say. Yeah. If you've been around me very long, you know, I never had a problem saying something, you know, figuring something.